Welcome to the Religious Studies Project, listeners. My name, as ever, is Christopher Carter, and I'm joined on my computer monitor by David Robertson, some 30 miles away, although it does look like it's about as sunny a day in Edinburgh as is here in Gifford. This week, we've got a younger up-and-coming scholar. You may have heard of him, uh, Russell McCutcheon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <Very nice>. and, <laughs> with Matt Sheedy, Tara Baldrick Marone, and being interviewed by Tenzin Eagle, long time responder, first time interviewer, and uh, a good pal of ours here. It's called Demystifying the Study of Religion, so let's get some clarity. Hello, we are gathered here today over the mighty interwebs to discuss Russell McCutcheon's latest book, Religion in Theory and Practice. Demystifying the Field for Burgeoning Academics. Uh, joining me is not only the author himself, Russell McCutcheon, but a couple of young scholars who contributed small pieces to the volume, Matt Sheedy and Tara Baldrick Maroney. Uh, Russell McCutcheon probably needs no introduction to most of our listeners, but just for some of those who may be new, he is professor of and chair of the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Alabama. Matt Sheedy is visiting professor of North American Studies at the University of Juan, and Tara Baldrick Maroney is PhD candidate and instructor in the Department of Religion at Florida State University. Now, part of what makes this book uh, special, and why I wanted to include Matt and Tara in this podcast, is that this isn't just another theory book about religious studies, but actively engages with questions about what it takes to make it as a scholar in today's world. And there were about 20 other young scholars, uh, including myself, who wrote short pieces for this book reflecting on some of the concerns and issues that young scholars face in the workplace today, as well as in their scholarship. So what I want to do is start with Russell and get a sense of what this book is all about, and then bring in Matt and Tara to the conversation and talk about their respective contributions and kind of think about some of the issues that burgeoning scholars face in the world today. Now, Russell, one of the first things that jumped out to me when I originally, initially read the blurb for the book on the back jacket is that it is a bit of a follow-up to your previous book, Entanglements. So I was hoping you might start by kind of, say, summarizing the general aim of the book for our listeners and saying something about how it relates to your previous work and how it differs. Sure. Thanks for wanting to talk about this. Uh, Entanglements was a, uh, a collection, uh, also with Equinox, of replies and rejoinders. I've been lucky enough to have uh, interactions with a variety of people over the years in print, and those things all just sit somewhere, have a life of their own. Nobody knows they happen if they don't stumble across it. And so I thought I'll pull this together. But in pulling that together, I wrote a fair bit of new material to open every one of the pieces and situate it, contextualize it, when was this given, why was it given. But in writing those, I explicitly tried to think of an earlier career reader who might not yet have had the luxury of doing these sorts of things or talking to these sorts of people. Because lately, I've, I've paid a fair bit of attention to um, job market issues, the things that have been issues for decades in the humanities, but have certainly hit peak in the last five, ten years in North America at least, uh, also in Europe now. So it occurred to me that that would be a good audience to write to, right? whatever anybody else did with it. Uh, so that was in Tanks. It certainly wasn't a how-to volume or anything. But then a review of Entanglements, and there have been many reviews, but a review of Entanglements written by um, Travis Cooper, who recently finished his PhD at Indiana. Mainly, I think, right in anthropology, but also in religious studies. He wrote a review of it and uh, had some qualms with the book here and there, said some nice things, said some critical things. But I opened the introduction to this set of pieces, quoting his review, where he basically says, where's the other senior career people in the field writing things like, where are they? Why aren't they writing things like this? And that stuck in my head after the press sent me a copy of that review. And for a variety of reasons, I've become an essayist. You know, I didn't set out to be an essayist, but I turned into an essayist in my career. And so periodically, I collect things together, things that have been published, things that haven't been published. And that was in my head. And uh, his review line prompted me to think, well, I have a number of things I've written on the field, on teaching, on the intro course that have not been pulled together. I had a few that hadn't been published yet. And so that's how this book came about, thinking specifically 
uh, to do it in an even more explicit way to address a variety of career and professional issues with the earlier career person in mind, whether they agree or not with what how I study religion, they'll probably at least come across certain departmental or professional issues. So that was the logic of this book. Okay, great. And maybe just to add to that, the, the organization of this book is also quite interesting. It's divided into three sections, right? You've got theory, in practice, and then in praxis. Is there a particular rationale for that division? Well, I finished this book quite a long time ago, to be honest. Um, well over a year, a year and a half ago. And presses all have their own publishing schedules. And, and the book originally had two sections. That's the title, in theory and in practice. And my logic was, you know, you're looking for some, you know, it's myth-making, right? You're looking for some hindsight organizational principle to pieces you're pulling together. You think in your head that they're they related somehow. And I thought, well, <clears throat> a group of these are mainly about my interests in the category religion, classification interests, but a number of these are a lot more practically concerned. They're about, you know, the Bolton blog series. I repurposed a piece that I wrote there that Matt was involved in commissioning, I think, right? How, how do you, what do you tell people you do when they ask you uh, as a scholar of religion? Um, a piece that I originally gave up at Chicago on practical choices you have to make in designing a curriculum or a syllabus. So there's your theory practice. But because the piece was done so long ago and it had not moved to copy editing, that's when it occurred to me that uh, a whole bunch of these additional pieces that people had replied to something that I wrote 10 years ago on professionalization issues, that what a perfect opportunity to get all these people, if they were interested, to get their pieces into print. I liked my theory practice division, and that's when it occurs to me, well, yes, praxis, why not? There's a third section. It's certainly not praxis in some you know, technical Marxist sense. But getting early career people, ABD people, or at least they were when they wrote this, not all of them still are, um, reflecting on their own situation in light of something talking about the profession from a decade ago, seemed to have this very nice integration of theory and practice, this very nice sense of practically applied theory. And thus, the structure of the book came about. You know, one thing that I liked about the book upon reading it is that it didn't just have say a lot of the familiar stuff that those of us who have read your other books say have come to know and expect from your work say such as a critique of the world religion paradigm and of, say tropes like the spiritual but not religious notion but also had this really kind of cool practice section where you almost were thinking through in some of the essays your own development as a teacher and scholar and how you kind of came to arrive at say certain more critical positions and it kind of gave a nice reflection upon the development of you and academic and religious studies in the field today over you know well that's very kind that's very you found some of those useful then yeah i thought there was just kind of an interesting juxtaposition because you didn't just get the say the critique, but how those critiques formed and how they formed particularly in the classroom and some of the pure reflections on the world, teaching introduction classes. But I have a question on that, so I'll get to that in a moment. Well, one thing I could say, jumping off that, is that I've long, and I've written about this, I've long been frustrated by the classic division of labor between teaching and research, and my teaching gets in the way of my research, and all kinds of people talk about that. Or, or on the other side, people will call themselves teaching specialists. I'm not really sure. I've never been sure exactly what that means, to be honest. In, in other words, I've never met a teaching specialist who teaches more than I do or teaches more different courses than I would. Like, I mean, we all generally do about the same. That division of labor, wherever you side yourself, has always been frustrating because, at least in my experience, um, the things that I've taught in classes have been deeply consequential to my writing. And I don't know anyone who teaches something in a class that didn't come from someone's research, right? We read books, we use books in classes, we do field work and talk about it in our class. So anything that draws attention to intimate cross-pollination between these strikes me as, a, as an important thing. Well, it's actually and it's one of the similarities between some of your essays and, say, the works of uh, Jonathan Z. Smith, is that cause he often did the same thing. He would use his essays as a occasion to reflect upon the intersection between the two, teaching and, and theory. 
For me, it was um, profoundly evident in my very first job when I was a full-time instructor at University of Tennessee. I've written about this. When they asked me, uh, this is an essay in a different book that's come out. Uh, I, I reflect on this quite explicitly. To use Houston Smith's The World's Religions, The Religions of Man, is his title, in one of my courses. And I didn't know much about Houston Smith's book. I kind of knew a little bit about it. I'm writing my dissertation. I'm not paying attention to that particular Smith. And I used it. I had to use it. And the kind of world religions critique someone like me would offer wasn't present in the field. You know, Mazazawa had years before she wrote her book. Then not many people are thinking much about it. And at least for me, that particular experience using book I was told to use in a classroom played a crucial role in helping to cement a real dissatisfaction with a particular model that probably prior to that I hadn't thought too much about. And thus, manufacturing religion takes on a new character. There's new examples used in that. Uh, there's specific things from Smith used as problems in the field, as instances of problems. So it was a frustrating experience for me using the book, but it was only a frustrating experience for me as I used the book, <laughs> right? And as I became familiar with that very popular model, a lot of other people were using. So again, that was fortuitous that they asked me to use that. That might This might work as a partial springboard to my... Next question, then. So one of the points you make in your introduction that I found interesting is that many of the concerns about current state of the field are not new, but have been of concern to young scholars for a number of years, including yourself when you were a young scholar. I found this interesting because it's something that I often thought about when I was a grad student and heard everybody complaining about the lack of jobs and current state in the humanities, because I would always kind of wonder to what extent these struggles were all knew how new they were. And so I guess I wanted to throw that question out here and maybe ask you to expand a bit on whether what you think is new for young scholars in today's climate and what is maybe similar. Do we face new challenges or is it all the same old? I, I say I think a little bit in the introduction and then a little bit in the intro to the third part before Matt's piece in the third part of the book. I think I, I repeat this. I also find frustrating the manner in which groups who might otherwise have shared interest consume each other in their critique, that I often now see conflicts between scholars more senior than myself, and I write about this a little bit in the book, and scholars much more junior to myself, and uh, the two of them quite critical of each other. You know, on the one side, I see almost a view of, uh, suck it up, it's all hard work, and on the other side, I see this view of, you know, you're a privileged older person and you don't really get how hard it is right now. While I certainly understand that situation, at least from where I sit, being well between those generations, I'm 57, so I'm not a 70-year-old scholar. I got my PhD in 95. I started doing my PhD in, I don't know, 88, 89, I kind of forget. So the generation that taught me, as opposed to the generation that are now getting PhDs, so I feel a little between those groups. And they strike me as having dramatically shared interests. They strike me as facing very similar problems, that there's all kinds of people in their 60s and 70s and 80s, you know, how old, how far back do we go, who certainly just walked into jobs. Yes, at times that happened. But if you ask scholars of those generations more about their own background, you easily start to hear stories of that are very identifiable with today. Today, however, especially, you know, post-2008 budget collapse, etc., it's ramped up dramatically, you know, and it's not just the 2008 budget collapse. At least here in the United States, state budgets where education is largely funded have been declining for decades steadily, right? The portion of state funds going to higher education. Uh, so none of this just happened overnight. This has been a steady process. But when you add the post-2008 budget collapse, it does seem to heighten it pretty dramatically. So I think they're incredibly similar situations. But the magnitude of the situation now, it's not difficult to see somebody in the situation now thinking, and perhaps rightly so, that it, it's a change in kind. You know, it is so heightened. So I guess, um, again, the attempt was to try to get a number of people currently in that situation. The pieces in the last se section of the book were written a few years ago, so some of those people's situations have changed, to really get to have a voice, and uh, I don't know what, you know, if we're here to convince people more senior than myself about anything, if they'll read this, they're retired perhaps, but to at least, you know, back to Travis Cooper's, 
to at least start thinking of those other senior people in the field. And it's not that like department chairs control universities, you know, they're largely the victims of funding decisions that happen elsewhere too. But to think a little more constructively about contingent labor, about PhD programs across the country, what should they be doing? How do we train students? What are we training them for, let alone MA programs? So if that starts a little bit of a conversation, that that would be wonderful. It's it's a long overdue conversation. There's tremendous interest probably against ever really having the conversation in a substantive way, but but I'm hopeful. Sorry to interrupt the episode, but we just wanted to let you know to remind you about our Patreon link. Uh, The Religious Studies Project has always been free since its inception, um, but we know that there's a great problem in academia with uh, people not being paid for the work that they're expected to do, particularly early career scholars. And we at the RSP want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So you can help if you can spare even one pound a month um, by going to patreon.com slash Project RS and subscribing. We know that these podcasts are very useful for people that are teaching and people in their learning. So if you can help um, either by subscribing there or by making a one-off donation using the PayPal button on our website, it'd be greatly appreciated and will help us keep bringing you this podcast for free and fight against exploitation in academia. But now, back to the episode. All right, that might be a good spot to turn to Matt and Tara. Their contributions were reflecting upon Russell's thesis on professionalization, which he originally wrote in 2007. So perhaps, uh, Matt, you could start by saying something about your role as editor of the bulletin and how these theses on the responses to the theses on professionalization came together and your specific response in the volume. Yeah. Um, well, thanks very much for this this invite and the opportunity to talk about uh, this sort of interesting collaborative project. I was, past tense, editor for the Bulletin of the Study of Religion blog. That's the blog portal of the journal uh, of the Bulletin of the Study of Religion from approximately 2012 to uh, this past summer, 2018, as the Bulletin has made some transitions in terms of editor. And I don't remember exactly how the idea for this came about, but Russ's piece, 21 Theses on Professionalization, had circulated for uh, for quite some time since it was originally uh, written, and it was something that was uh, widely read and uh, occasionally talked about. And so it became this opportunity some approximately seven, eight, nine years uh, after the fact to revisit some of the questions and theses that he proposed uh, with early career scholars who are trying to sort of navigate uh, the job market to deal with questions of professionalization uh, more generally. So. Um, you know, with uh, a few suggestions from Russ and drawing on people that I knew uh, as a role at editor, uh, as editor rather, uh, at the Bulletin, I was able to to bring together 21 early career scholars, various stages in their careers, uh, some who were ABD, uh, some who had uh, just finished their PhDs, some who were taking on visiting professorships and postdocs and so forth, to reflect on particular questions uh, as they relate to their, to their own experience. And so, what I think is really interesting about these responses is that it reflects a, a fairly broad range of scholars uh, dealing with similar sets of questions uh, in and around the same time uh, with uh, wildly uh, different uh, experiences. You know, for me, when uh, I was asked to bring all these together and uh, it became this interesting project, the idea of turning this into a book came about through a variety of conversations. And that never fully place for a variety of reasons. and. The idea of turning these blog responses into a book was temporarily shelved. And then Russ came to me uh, and said that, you know, he thought uh, if I was interested, that a portion of his book would be a good place to include these responses. Uh, not only because they're obviously pieces responding to, to something that he had written, um, but because it uh, reflects very much uh, this idea of uh, religion and practice and engaging the process of professionalization, engaging Young scholars, and so um, you know, it really worked out that way. That everyone was able to rethink their pieces um, upwards of, of, of two years on from originally writing them to get that published uh, in this volume. For me, I talk about how, as as Russ touched upon earlier, uh, the two thousand and eight economic crisis was really a crucial hinge in how a lot of us, at least early career scholars, have been thinking about 
this process of professionalization. And whether or not and to what extent these problems were around and, and persisted in, in earlier generations, certainly conversations, uh, narratives about the crisis, not only in the global economy, but also in academia, really started to come to the fore. By my estimation, in the aftermath of things like the Occupy Wall Street movement in 2011, shortly after that, 2012, 2013, uh, one started to see regular articles appear in outlets like the Chronicle for Higher Education and a variety of other forms talking about younger academics having problems getting jobs, having problems making that transition. And more generally, this idea that the economic crisis was, was sort of finally coming to uh, the academy. Uh, and the assumption here is that there was a bit, of a bit of a lag, a bit of a delay in terms of the impacts and the effects on less and less people getting jobs. And for me, one of the things that I, that I mention is uh, the experiences of two scholars uh, in particular, uh, one of whom, Kelly J. J. Baker, has a piece in the 21 Theses on Professionalization. She very publicly made a decision to walk away from uh, academia and yet at the same time pursue a writing career that was related to her training in the study of religion, related to broader problems of being an academic, getting a job, the current job market, questions of gender, and so forth. And so She's a really interesting example of someone who has, you know, made lemonade out of the lemons that she was given, uh, so to speak. Uh, another scholar that I mention is Kate Daly Bailey, who was engaged with academic circles. That I, I, I certainly am a part of, and I, Russ and Tara and a number of others as well. And she made an announcement as well, uh, I think around 2014, 2015, that she was uh, leaving academia because there weren't enough jobs for her uh, as an adjunct. And this sort of, you know, struck me as a very somewhat personal and or at least emblematic uh, instance of uh, someone I knew who seemed to have all all the chops, all the skills, all the motivation to do this job and do it well, but had to to walk away because of her own experience with, with those uh, structural conditions. And so those are the few things that I, I uh, gesture to in the introduction. And, uh, you know, I also bring together just sort of a, an overview of uh, the different themes that are talked about and covered in the 21 theses, uh, as well as the changes that had taken place uh, over the course of about two years, you know, seeing certain people succeed, get tenure track positions, in other cases, people remaining adjuncts, still working through their PhDs, and in some cases, um, scholars having left uh, academia either temporarily or, or altogether. And so it really struck me as a, a microcosm bringing these 21 scholars together of all of the different uh, sort of experiences that one may encounter in this uh, current uh, market, specifically related to the study of religion. Yeah, that's definitely one of the uh, most interesting parts. Having read them all when they were first initially published on the bulletin and then reading them now is kind of the development, some of the responses over the, the couple of years. Uh, initially, I think when everybody wrote, there's a more morbid tone in some of the, at least mine, Mine was very, when I first wrote it, was like, everything's hopeless. But <laughs> now, now my reflection a couple of years on is a little bit more nuanced. Throwing it to Tara, perhaps you could say something about uh, your thesis and your response. Sure. Uh, thank you for asking about this. I responded to uh, thesis number six and the general point of this thesis that Russ wrote is that simply getting a doctoral degree is no longer enough to obtain a full-time position in academia. And in my, in my response, I discussed how this is related to the hyper-professionalization that has been occurring in the humanities that people like Frank Donahue have written about in The Last Professors. And the idea is that younger scholars, uh, those still in graduate school, are expected to publish, to gain a lot of teaching experience while they are still students, as they're still working on their own, their own coursework uh, in order to professionalize them, so to speak, in order to obtain that tenure track job. And as, as Matt was talking about, that's not always the case. You can sort of fulfill all of these requirements and still not obtain 
a secure full-time position in academia as uh, the examples that he mentioned, Kate Daly Bailey and Kelly J. Baker. And so I, I wanted to draw attention to this because this is, you know, one of the things that we are all told that if we do all of these extra things, we can attain that position. And looking at the job numbers from the reports released by the American Academy of Religion and the Society of Biblical Literature, the number of tenure track jobs have actually been decreasing. And that just is further evidence, I think, of those positions not being available. Yeah, and the amount of grad students doubling in the process, <laughs> which is the uh, those two colliding with the the faculty uh, tenure track positions decreasing, and then the PhD applicants doubling or tripling. It uh, creates a quandary. Yeah, definite strategies are are needed, and it's it's so tricky once you you know get out in the workplace and you're actually then responsible for even recruiting new MA students. Like I am now in my current position, and you kind of feel this burden where you're like you the department is asking you for more students, and you know to promote the department because they want the revenue from the students, but then at the same time you know like well, what's the what's the end here. It's just more PhD students on the job market. Now, in my in my response to Russell's thesis on professionalization, I address the gap between what we study as grad students and what we are expected to teach once we are working in the field. And I would like to extend that uh, topic to both you, Matt, and Tara for consideration. Since both of you are now teaching at the moment, I'm wondering if you'll be able to offer some reflection on the gap you have experienced between your, say, early dissertation and research topics and the actual content that you have been expected to teach. Have you found any conflict between these areas? And if so, how have you dealt with that? Maybe we could start with um, Matt. Well, for me, I would say it's very much uh, a mixed bag. My, My training is in critical social theory, broadly speaking. I look at religion in the public sphere, focused on uh, the Frankfurt School and Habermas in particular, its theories of, of secularism, and offer a um, what I consider a fairly strong critique of, of, of that position. I have, for example, had to teach fairly generic on the books courses like Ethics and World Religions, uh, among other classes, uh, that with only one exception, in the case of an online course, required me to follow a standard uh, introductory textbook. I've been very fortunate, apart from that, to have the opportunity to basically reimagine or redesign those courses when teaching them in person in any way that I see fit. Uh, that's been, I guess, fortuitous in, in, in my case and in, in my recent position in my second year as a visiting professor in a North American Studies Department uh, at the University of Bonn. And that might be worth mentioning something briefly about that particular transition, but getting hired on as a visiting professor there. Uh, again, now in my second year, I have an opportunity for a third year next year. Uh, I was given complete autonomy to design whatever courses uh, that I wanted. And so I don't have any particular complaints in that regard. When I have and continue to teach some of these courses online, uh, that's when the sort of constraints come in. I have on occasion had to teach textbooks that reflect the world religion's paradigm. You know, on a, a personal level, it, uh, it might have some utility in getting me to constantly re-engage those ideas for my own work moving forward, but uh, pedagogically it can be uh, very limiting, uh, so I've had some issues with that. Uh, and the other uh, broader point that I, that I just wanted to mention uh, was that in my current position uh, in the Department of, of North American Studies, uh, I hadn't really anticipated making that kind of shift from religious studies. A friend sent me an application to this uh, visiting professorship opportunity at the University of Bonn. And I gave it a ca- casual glance and thought to myself, well, you know, I, I'm a scholar of religion, uh, a scholar of, you know, critical social theory, cultural studies, these sorts of things. I'm not really sure if that fits. And my friend replied back, well, uh, why not? You focus on North America for the most part, West more generally. Uh, and I said, okay, yeah, that's a good point. I sent her an application and, and they were, they were thrilled to get someone who focuses on North America 
comes at it from the study of religion. And so um, maybe to <laughs> make a slight shift away from the doom and gloom and, and the negative stories often associated with this current academic market, for me at least in this particular uh, instance, uh, I was able to uh, sort of uh, transfer my skills to a slightly different department and came to realize very quickly that while their own particular data set uh, in this Department of North American Studies may not be religion, quote unquote, um, we share very similar theoretical uh, backgrounds. And so uh, there are certainly in my experience, I know in the experience of others, opportunities like that uh, to continue to professionalize, to get a postdoc, to get a visiting professorship, uh, and hopefully use that as a springboard uh, to move forward. So just wanted to sort of put, uh, put a shiny spin on uh, that dimension of my experience. Shiny spins are always welcome. Turning to Tara, what are maybe what is the gap that you have experienced between your dissertation and research topic and, and your teaching experience? I am in the religions of Western antiquity track in my department, and I have been trained as a historian of early Christianities. Uh, translating Greek and Latin uh, and focusing mainly uh, on 2nd to 6th century CE. But there aren't many courses besides uh, the Intro to New Testament course that specifically focus on related issues. And so I've been teaching courses that my department needs me to teach. Uh, some of those courses include Introduction to World Religions, a Multicultural Film Course, and uh, Gender and Religion. Uh, and so I have attempted to make that teaching work for me in a sense. Uh, so some of my earlier work has been on the world religions paradigm, uh, presenting papers, for example, at, uh, at Nasser meetings uh, about that, along with Mike Graziano and Brad Stoddard, and also thinking about how I might teach other courses in similar manners, such as uh, gender and religion, which is what I'm doing right now. And so I can't just focus on those areas that I've been trained in. Uh, I have to broaden my own uh, research interest in order to you know, teach my students uh, about something other than the ancient world. So there, there is a gap there, but I think that I've uh, made it work for me by pairing some of my research interests uh, with other topics that I'm either you know nominally interested in or that I think my students will be interested in. Great. Well, thank you very much, Russell and Matt and Tara for joining us today. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much for that discussion, everyone. An important discussion. And, but, you know, without blow, Russell doesn't really need us to blow his trumpet. But um, emblematic of the sort of work that, that Russell has been doing in the field for a number of years, really helping out younger scholars, um, helping map the field, give people opportunities, break them out of the mold and so on. So excellent putting people that together <laughs> that's uh, something he does a lot of yeah and and a long time supporter of the rsp and indeed one of the um i suppose we should say for legal reasons russell mccutcheon is a trustee of the religious studies project association oh, yes yes he is <laughs> it's uh, next week's an interview that i recorded the second uh interview i recorded in helsinki with ilka lindstedt we're talking about early islam and pre-Islamic Arabia, we've just got sort of critical approaches to that region in time and space. But um, his work largely uses epigraphy, so I didn't even really know what that was, uh, looking at um, ancient inscriptions and archaeology, and then also using modern social identity theory approaches to look at how different groups in the Quran are, are being constructed and interacting and look at the sort of power dynamics um, inherent in early Islamic texts. So it, it's quite a quite a fun interview, a little bit outside our usual area, but really not at the same time. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely not. We're always looking for opportunities to cover Islam and, you know, the world religions. I'm doing, I'm doing air quotes from a critical lens. It's 
certainly the case that certain traditions are more often covered critically, you know, or like North American religion is is more often covered from that point of view but other there are institutional and personal reasons why other things are less often assessed critically so it's harder for us to get opportunities to do it um i have another interview on uh, critical pedagogy in teaching islam with matthew hayes coming up later in the year so we've got yeah a, you know, and ben marcus has recorded one with um asma Udin on oh, right yeah yeah, on, uh, w- w- when Islam is rhetorically or strategically considered to be a religion or not. Um, so oh, that'll be, yeah, that'll be excellent. Criti- yeah, critical Islam series coming up. Well, ooh, Indeed, unintentional. Um, if so. you haven't checked out April's discourse episode for all the Patreon supporters and those who have access to the Patreon supporters through your national society, so if you're a member of the BASR or the NASR, um, you'll be able to hear the most recent episode of discourse which was hosted for us by Theo Wildcroft um, of the Open University um, discussing the news through a critical lens so do go and check that out and And, um, yeah I think that's pretty much everything isn't it pretty much all right right. okay bye cheers for listening eh bye The RSP is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. The Religious Studies Project is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, SCIO, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation, charity number SC047750. Brought to you by founders and editors-in-chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and managing editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Marek Sullivan and Rebecca Barrett-Fox and our opportunities digest by Ella Bock. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock with audio editing by Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop and video editing by Jonathan Tuckett. Don't forget you can support the project by using our amazon.com.co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com slash projectrs and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, YouTube, iTunes and other portals.